I'm Les Thompson and you join me today in the heart of the Shropshire Valley at the prolific Moncourt Fisheries. A venue that's absolutely stuffed to the gunnels with fish, be it F1s, carp, oid, and run by the Stanford family who've put lots and lots of time and effort into bringing an old venue right up into a modern standard. It's absolutely beautiful. Match weights here go up to like 200 pounds and normally it's pole fishing that people target to try and chase these weights. But on lakes such as the Hawk, what we're on today, methods like this one I'm going to show you, the pellet feeder, can be deadly. Just a one rod attack can be enough just to get that 200 or 150, 200 pound that you need to win the match. There's the first cop. So that's the sort of stamp you're looking at. The real weight builders, they just hold him up. Get him all unhooked. Oh. Steady on, old boy. Here we go. That's the sort of fish where we can get hold of him that you're going to be targeting. So it's not going to take you long to build up a weight, but the method and the pellet feeder are often seen as just throwaway methods to either start a match or just find a little bonus fish. So I'm going to show you a few things that will be able to take you from the start to the end of the match with one rod to get that first place. Right then, so if you're going to put all your eggs in one basket, all your faith in one attack, your setup's got to be right. So let's just have a look at mine. We've got a 4,000 size reel. It's not the biggest chuck in the world, but it's the size of reel that I like to use. We've got an eight pound main line. It's a heavy sinking line, so it's going to get in, get down straight away, so it's not going to lay on the surface, get me a nice connection to the tip. And this is one of the little rods that I love using at this moment in time, the Garbolino Essential 10 foot method feeder. Wonderful through action. It's got a lot of backbone in it, but ever, as soon as the rod starts to compress and the fish are underneath your feet, it absorbs every single lunge. And that's what you need when you're playing these really feisty little left ones and carp, when the bigger fish moving, just to stop them diving back underneath your pallet. It has happened a few times, but it happens to us all. Uh, and it just basically lets you stay in full control of your fish. So we come away from the main line, breaks it down to these little beauties, the pellet feeder. Now I tend to sway towards the pellet feeder purely and simply because it offers me the similar sort of control that if I was approaching to fish that island, that sort of approach with a pole. If that was in 13 metres and an angler was to set up to fish there, he'd have two or three lines and he'd be tapping out the little kinder pot, just tapping and bring a couple of fish in, a couple of fish in, a couple of fish in. And that's the way I like to do things as opposed to throwing a method feeder out and getting lots of particles in straight away and creating a real frenzy. So I want to keep everything under control. So I've got this small method feeder. I have got it in different sizes, which I'll talk you through later. And then I've got an 017 hook length and then a 14 hook with a little band. Just so I've got a selection of hook lengths, which I'll talk you through again. And it's just, that's it basically. It works on a little feeder bead so I can interchange the hook lengths. It's a dead simple setup, but it has to be the right setup. And for me, that's a perfect little blend of all the components that you're going to need. It's so like I say, that one rod attack to get you over the line. Lots of fish, hopefully. <laughs> but it's crazy, some of the bites have just been, just little, a little drop back as they've run and kited away. Then other bites have been dead aggressive and just gone, pff, I mean that one straight away, he's banged and hit the clutch, which is set. Feels like a better fish actually. So, we'll just get him back and then I'll talk you through how I prepare micros. It's dead basic, but there's so much out there, or oh, two minutes, 30 seconds. It varies from fishery to fishery with the pellets and the different brands they use. It varies from the pellets that you can buy on the shelf. And for me, it's a visual thing and texture. When, you've got, when you actually see it in the, when it's in the bowl and you've got them exactly how you want, then you know that they're right not flooding them with water and things. So we'll just up this little carp, we'll up this little carp, and I'll show you how I prepare my bait. Lovely. Pristine, even. 
preparation of your pellets is, is paramount for the feeder fishing. Um, lots of people get confused with it. Is it two minutes, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. There's no set rule. For me, it's all about when I know what they want to look like visually and how they squeeze and hold together. So that is the main key things for me. Monkhall Fisheries is a fishery pellet rule only. Good value. He doesn't try to squeeze every last penny out of his anglers. Does that, Ben? £1.50 for a pint and a half. Absolutely spot on. Good quality pellets. He's an angler himself, so he wants to be fishing with good quality pellets. If I could use my own, again, another low oil, good quality pellet, what I use is the bag and range, two mils. But I can't use those because it's a fishery rules only. So, back to preparing them. Dead simple. Some people use wetters and different things. It just confuses, confuses stuff. But it's part, it, it is key that you don't want a big ball of stodge. You just want them so they just use their own. They take on enough water and use their own stickiness and that just to stick and stay in the feeder. Enough so you can cast them, maintain their integrity so they're going to work out when they hit the bottom of the lake. So they're in the bowl and we're just going to flood them. Flood them clean out. Loads of water. Simple as, bit of a stir around, get the ones that are floating off the surface. That's it. And literally we're going to leave that. Well, you just see the water start to discolour as the, out, the outside starts to take it off. So you see the film starts to build. Bit of a stir around. Done. Now you can either put them in a strainer or the old landing net. Everyone carries them I in this one's a bit extreme for what we're fishing here. But Ben likes to provide all his anglers with his own nets and everything. He looks after his fishery so he don't have any diseases. So I'll just put them all in the strainer. Simple as. Drain them off. Let them sit and rest. Done. And by the, by the time that I want to use those, by the time I've set up my rod, got all my side tray out, everything, they'll be absolutely perfect. And they'll sit lovely in the feeder. Just how I want them all together. Right then, pellets are prepped. They've took on all the water they need to do, and like I said, there they go, they bind perfectly, just sticky enough, but they break down lovely. So as soon as the water gets into contact with the feeder, they'll start to push out and release. Now some do's and don'ts with the pellet feeder. I've seen lots of anglers when they started playing about with these, get, a, get the, the hook length and get all that and pack it in, and then they start shovel it in and then they press and press and press. But the idea of a pellet feeder is that the water is going to, as it gets to the bottom, it's going to flush and everything's going to come out the feeder in a nice little pulse and it's going to deliver your hook bait into this nice little pouch of bait so it's all a little targeted area. Like I spoke about before, it's about keeping control in the peg. So we want it so we get a nice release so that your pellet is coming out at the same time. So what we're going to do, so I'll just put a little bit in the back, pat that in a little bit and drag that in with my thumb. Now, depending on the situation that, I, that I'm in like today, bites have been, been quite quick, but I still don't want an initial burst because I don't want fish flying off everywhere. So the top part, just the last bit, I'm going to give it just a little bit of a firmer press so it delays the release. So it's going to get to the bottom and then it's going to start to work. If I put it on loose, just soft like that, it'll hit the surface and these bits will start to break away. Any tail patterns and activity that's already started, it's going to spread bait out of the area and this fish going to start popping up everywhere. So basically the best way to load it, a little bit in first, press it in, in with your hook bait and cap it off with a nice little firmer push. One thing I did speak about earlier was the reason why I prefer this to a method feeder <coughs> and comparing it to when you're using a pole and if you look at exactly the amount of feed content that we get when we're using a pellet feeder compared to a pot, and I'll just show you now, so you've got a cab pot, so imagine you're going over, if that island was close, you'd be tapping out pellets frequently. So that's a small cab pot, some people use them in summertime, but in winter time generally, but there we go. So we've got that sort of quantity of pellets in the corner of that box. So the size of the pellet feeder we're using, it's just that, what we've got in there with the hook bait, let's get it about right, yep. So there's some sort of a, 
keep them back separate. A similar sort of comparison of what we're trying to achieve. So like I say, frequent casting, building it up nice and steady, switching between independent lines from one point to the other, rotating, keeping fish ticking over, trying to stop a frenzied situation. Just about to cast this one and then I'll talk you through the two lines that I've been fishing and picking up F1s and carp with. One to where that one's just dropped, just say half a metre from the point. Just sink that line, get everything set nice. And there's a nice little ledge that comes out on this island. It just, that's why I can get away with fishing. The feeder size that I'm fishing at the moment is 50, little 15 gram. So less disturbance, because it's only a short chuck. I want to keep everything to a minimum and try and keep all the control in my favour. And I've picked up a few fish there, and when it's just got a little bit too much and it's got a bit iffy, even though there's, there's been plenty of bites, to be fair, I've moved then over to the sedge bed where there's that little bit more cover and they feel a little bit more comfortable, rotated the line and picked up a few more fish. But there's been plenty of bites to be had, to be fair. Another indication there, there's lots and lots of fish grubbing around. But that's the key and the beauty of pellet feeder fishing. And I'll, sp I'll speak to this and show you this in, in a moment when I show the actual amount of content that's actually inside that feeder, as opposed to a pole pot or a method feeder, or just your, like your different size cab pots, because we all use different sizes and some people tend to get carried away. But these little tiny pellet feeders, like I say, seem to keep everything on our terms which is what we want to do, try and keep as much control as possible. There's a missed bite. Frequency of cast is another thing. You tend, if you were to ship, ship out and miss your bite or lose your pellet, you would quickly put a few more micros in your pot, ship back over, tap them out again. You wouldn't think twice about doing it, but the amount of anglers that you see that will pick up a rod, throw it, sit there, have a cuppa, wait and wait and wait, praying for the rod to go around. Fish just turning on that straight away. So they're waiting for things to happen instead of creating something. That's the key. Frequency of bait, frequency of cast, as if you were still straight away, before we could even sink the line. An F1 or a car. I'm surprised we ain't had any eye today, to be fair. They tend to normally go crazy when there's a few micros about, but they ain't had a chance in amongst all these carp and F1s. What we got? There we go. A little dumpy one. Beautiful F1. The best part of a pound and a bit. Solid unit. There he is. Another fine monk hall specimen. Staple on this venue. A little bright white bandom has been the best bait so far. I've alternated different colours, yellows and oranges, but it's tended to get more coloured, the more visual of a white or a yellow. But the white has definitely been the one that they've wanted. Just a few more pellets back in the feeder. I'll touch more on the loading of the feeder again later on because that also is important lots of people get that wrong by putting the whatever hook bait they have in the wrong position and they don't get the release from the feeder what they need so there's nothing coming out in a neat little pile the bait can sometimes remain in or they pack it too hard just leave a little a little bit more of a tail don't wind it too close to your tip when you're going to cast it out it's only a gentle lob it's not too much of a, a distance chuck nice and steady slow it down Sink the line, another one turned again. There's some fish there now. 
But like I say, it's all about keeping it in your favour. It's important just to keep that little length of tail when you're going to cast out. Don't get too close to the tip because you'll dart it at the water and it'll be, you won't be able to control it or move too quick. So just that little gentle lob over, slow it down, rod back, plop. Keep the disturbance to a minimum. Look at that indication straight away. Really is an exciting way of fishing. It's just as good as watching a float berry for me when that tip's doing this and whoop. Swirls and boils and turns. Well, as you can see, the peg's gone a little bit hectic over both lines now. It's sort of good. It's going to be with the only angler on the lake. So with pressure, we'll be able to maintain more control. But with the only angler on the lake, lots and lots of fish are in the area. It's gone a little bit hectic. But there is a way to try and calm things down, and that's to change your pellet size, your actual feed. So what we're going to do now, switch over to some four mils, which in true Blue Peter, Blue Peter fashion, we've got here. We're going to soak these up start introducing those through the feeder and hopefully bring everything back under control on my terms. Always seems to just calm them back down, putting far less feeding, but you're still getting the similar sort of content. So, pins them down, bit of an heavier bait, away we go. Well, that brings to an end a great session. Uh, we've caught lots of carp, lots of F1s. Surprisingly no oid today, which we normally do when there's micros involved. But uh, going just off the point of the island and on the second line to the reeds and the sedges there. Lovely depth, we've got about 18 inches. Lovely shelf just stepped out from there. Lots of fish did come into the peg at one point. It got a bit frenzied, but being the only angler on the lake that was always going to happen there's one point of food and there's fish come from everywhere it's heavily stock venue uh, the switch to four mils definitely worked it calmed them back down and helped them just pin them back to the bottom just changing it from a, that little nugget of micros to several four mils even though the food contents there because it's still a four mil is basically a group of micros put together but the content stayed there less particles on the bottom so that definitely calmed them down got it back under control and the fish kept take, uh, taking the rod round and ticking along lovely. So let's have a look at what we've got. 